uh, what's going on out there? And this was the first question that our panel asked. And uh, we asked clinicians, we asked methadone treatment providers or OTP providers, as they've been called, and um, to get the best perspective possible, somebody along the way, I think the first speaker, uh, suggested, why don't we ask uh, those who are ensuring methadone treatment to see what is in fact going on out there. What are the uh, cases that are coming to the attention? We see about them in the newspapers all too often and all too late. Uh, in this case, we, we would want to hear from the source what is in fact really going out there. And we have two speakers that are about to come to the panel and I think uh, share with you experience and insight that, uh, as Master Card would say, is priceless. Um, the first speaker will be David Zerloff. He's the president of David Zerloff and Associates, an insurance agency specializing in the liability insurance of methadone treatment. He's been an insurance consultant to the American Association for Treatment of Opiate Dependence, ATOC, uh, for more than 20 years, and they too should be acknowledged for their support and help. ATOC uh, and uh, Mark Perino and, and group uh, uh, Eric Guinness, who've been just great supporting and helping this conference come together. David will be followed by Rich Willits. I, I, I won't introduce Rich now, I'll do it now so that we can uh, just have him come up. He's the National Program Director for the Addiction Treatment Providers Insurance Program. NSM uh, Insurance Group. Rich uh, has developed the largest insurance program in the United States focused exclusively on behavioral health care and the addiction treatment industry with over 2,500 treatment facilities currently insured through NSM Insurance Group. So with David uh, the first and Rich, please come up to the podium and, and then go on with the work. Good morning. I'm, I'm David Zerloff. I'm an insurance agent for Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. Um, I thought I'd uh, just speak for a few moments about how I got involved in showing methadone treatment and what kind of lawsuit trends I've seen in, in my career doing this and maybe a word or two about managing risk. Um, I, uh, I, I first uh, started ensuring methadone treatment in uh, June of 1984 when uh, the, uh, the methadone, nine methadone clinics in New Jersey uh, were divested by, this, by the state and became private nonprofits. They put out insurance for bid and um, I became their agent. They were really very, very gracious to me. Uh, um, as a little bit aside, that's relative to me anyway. It was the first sale I'd, I'd ever made as an insurance guy. And uh, they were very supportive of me. And uh, I, probably because I needed support. And one of the things they did was they introduced me to Mark Perino, the uh, president of ATOD. At, at that time, Mark was the um, president of the Northeast Regional uh, Methodist Coalition which uh, was uh, Association of Six States. And um, Mark, um, like, like um, any good leader of an organization, you know, he, he has a lot of crises to deal with and problems at the moment, but he also uh, always has his eye on future threats, future risks. And he saw the availability and um, affordability of insurance as a potential risk for methadone treatment as a whole. And, and as a matter of fact, it, he was, in my opinion, he was right. There were very few companies insuring methadone treatment and um, the insurance industry is a conservative industry and it was sort of counterintuitive for underwriters to um, want to insure um, treatment providers providing um, um, uh, addictive, lethal narcotic to hardcore drug addicts in the inner city. And um, he felt that there needed to be someone to um, act as a bridge between the methadone uh, treatment community and the insurance industry. And he suggested that I be that person. I might want to be that person. He suggested it might be good for me from a business perspective. And I didn't have too much going one at a time, so uh, I, I agreed to I agreed to do it, although with 
some hesitation because I didn't see, uh, I was, it was unclear to me how I could make a difference in, in availability and affordability of insurance for that property. But over the years, we, certainly from ourselves, I feel we have been successful in doing that. And we've, uh, uh, the main thing we've done is educate the, uh, the industry. Um, and the main way we did that was, and I just met with Mark uh, last week, and he confirmed my, my memory of this. We, every year for the past 25 years, we met with uh, representatives from the insurance industry at least uh, twice a year. So we've had uh, 60 or 70 meetings with uh, insurance company representatives. And some of it was uh, the same people twice, but most of it was uh, uh, people looking to start programs and people, underwriters already in, involved in insuring methadone and uh, or um, uh, uh, people who are running programs. And um, uh, at the same time, I, I did my best to educate myself about methadone treatment. I started insuring methadone programs, so I, I had an opportunity to talk to a lot of methadone providers. I've been to just about every ATOD conference since the first one in 1984. Uh, so I, I've been somebody outside the field who nonetheless has had a window into it. And, um, I have, I guess, my own perspective. But one thing I wanted to say, I, one thing that I think is important to say, and, and uh, please excuse me if I'm being presumptuous or just saying the obvious, but uh, I think it's important to say this, and that's a method on treatment saves lives. That's, that's the overwhelming fact about methadone treatment. And I just feel that that's necessary to say because we're going to be talking about wrongful deaths and, and, and um, uh, you see these uh, the billboards that say methadone kills and New York, front page New York Times, methadone killer drugs and such. And I think it's important to, uh, to remember that Methadone saves lives. It saves, literally saves lives and it saves people's lives on all kinds of different levels. Mm -hmm. And I also, you know, there's been a, a lot of news about uh, 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 increases in, in methadone deaths in the United States. And um, there's been four very credible studies that have shown that these, these deaths are, are not coming out of OTPs. They're due to uh, pain treatment. And um, uh, I, I think we can say with quite a bit of accuracy, it may be some ex, you know, little exceptions, but there, have, there is no more, on a per capita basis, not more people dying in, in OTPs than, than there was in the past. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot, a lot more people in treatment, but on a per capita basis, there's, there's no evidence of more people dying in treatment. <laughs> but there is an awful lot of evidence, an awful lot of evidence that um, more suits against methadone programs are increasing. And I can say that, you know, absolutely. You know, I, I don't insure most methadone clinics. I have a small market share, but it varies maybe between 10, 10 20 percent of methadone programs in the United States. But I think we can extrapolate. There's some trends that are so prominent that I think we can extrapolate what's, what's going on out there. And also, as I say, I had the opportunity to speak to, uh, to meet with uh, insurance company representatives on a regular basis. So, um, the overriding trend for the first seven years that I was insuring methadone treatment was that there were no lawsuits at all. We didn't have one lawsuit. Not one, the first seven years that uh, I was insuring uh, methadone treatment. It was, uh, and um, so I had a, I had a, uh, a pretty good message to give to these people from the industry that I was meeting with, which is that there were no claims. Um, and, and it's sort of interesting that back then there were far fewer companies willing to insure methadone treatment, and they were, they were. Um, and when they would insure it, it was usually on, 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 on uh, weak terms of claims made coverage with exclusions and such. And um, today, it's, 
it's, it, 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 there are far more insurers <coughs> willing to uh, insure methanol related. That's due to uh, a few reasons. It may, you know, I, I'd like to think it's partially due to the work that uh, Mark and I did, but um, uh, it's also a, a big factor is this concept of niche marketing. Which um, uh, insurance companies found that it was more efficient to uh, to market and, and process insurance on a on a niche basis, and so companies are always looking for niches, and and methadone treatment uh, has fallen into niches of uh, like the work that uh, that Rich does in his program. Um, when we did start seeing claims, uh, you know, I just give you an overview of what we were, what, I, what I've seen, and uh, it, I may be a little off topic here, but one of, one of the uh, most, a very, very common claim against methadone treatment has to do with, with employment issues, um, uh, wrongful termination, sexual harassment of employees, and I, I mentioned that there are, there are plenty of methadone programs that have, have never had a malpractice claim, but have, have had multiple employment claims. And uh, just sort of word to the, to the wise, and this, especially these uh, sexual harassment claims are uh, really very pain, painful, and uh, uh, you can't get around with your employees the way you used to. And um, also watch out for the holiday parties. Uh -huh. um, but uh, the, the, another trend we see is, uh, that I've seen is, Pretty much from the very beginning when we started seeing uh, lawsuits that were uh, uh, trip and fall claims. And I do insure other types of social service agencies, so I think I can say with uh, a lot of accuracy that uh, methadone clinics do have more trip and fall claims than other types of social service agencies. And that may be just the nature of the traffic issue. Um, but uh, I was going over my claims history and preparation of, you know, just for talking here, uh, over and over again, I saw it tripped, tripped, tripped in one the ice, tripped on this, the see that, over and, and, and over and, and over again. And, um, but tripped on the stairs, or tripped in the parking lot. And usually those claims aren't that big. They have to settle for, you know, several thousand dollars perhaps, if, if anything at all, depending on uh, whether they can establish fault or not. But we, we did, a couple years ago, we did have a half, half a million dollar claim from a trip and fall. So, and, and it's, it's something that is amenable, amenable to, uh, to loss control and skid uh, um, strips and, of course, uh, you know, maintenance issues. And, uh, and by the way, these trip and falls are, are an indication of, uh, of my concept anyway. I think you can this again that the whole, your whole, the whole organization has to be involved with, with, with risk management. It's not just the head or the doctors. So even something as simple as maintenance can, can, be, a, can, can be important. And then we, we also uh, uh, had a variety of claims over the years that were, you know, the little patterns in. Uh, Sexual harassment of uh, of patients is something I've, I've seen uh, not, not all the time, but we, we do see it, and uh, you know, usually a counselor issue, with it. and certainly the counselors some, sometimes counselors dating a patient, which is you know, by definition that's what a, it, it, could, it, it, could, it could lead to problems, of course, and. Uh, we had some. We have had some patient or patient violence. Um, uh, some failure to, to diagnose HIV or a particular uh, hepatitis. And again, those those claims uh, are you know they usually settle for anything for small amounts. You know, one thing maybe we're saying is that insurance companies settle claims. They don't want to, don't, nobody, the, the plaintiff's attorney or the insurance company, neither of them want to go to court because the plaintiff's attorney is working on a contingency 
and um, he, uh, he doesn't want the uncertainty of getting nothing, and he doesn't want the expense, he or she doesn't want the expense of going to court. It's, 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 a, it's much more efficient for an attorney to send a letter and, 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 and settle for uh, $10,000. So insurance companies don't like to go to court either, first of all, because of the expense, and second of all, for the uncertainty. And, um, but the, uh, the principal claims, the overriding trend that started uh, in the early 90s was um, wrongful death claims during induction. And, uh, and, and by the way, it, I, I have no, I have no reason to assume that people, patients were dying in induction uh, before the early 90s, but legal trends changed. Uh, lawyers came, uh, started to advertise uh, um, the concept of working on contingency became uh, much more common. And the, uh, the, whereas the past, just my perspective, my perception was the past lawsuits have been uh, like a rich person's game. Where, but in the early 90s, uh, everyone started participating, especially if they felt agreed. <coughs> so these, uh, these um, wrongful death claims from induction were uh, uh, a lot of times were allegations that. Uh, A lot of times, allegations that the patient was uh, wasn't addicted to opioids, uh, which uh, you're going to hear this again and again today, I assume. <laughs> but um, documentation is, is everything. You have to document. If, if it's not documented, it's indefensible. We also. Uh, so uh, uh, induction claims involving take-homes, and uh, uh, these induction claims, the uh, payouts are getting larger and larger as time goes on. You've also had... Um, take-homes, do, do you mean take-homes not enough or too many? No, I'm talking about giving a, a, new, a new patient a uh, take-home. Like a patient comes in on Saturday, gets a take home for Sunday, and he's dead by Monday. Um, the, uh, we do have claims of state for stabilized patients, um, wrongful death claims for stabilized patients, but they're, they're much rarer. And another really big trend is the third party liability issues. <coughs> Where, um, uh, which the insurance companies are very concerned about because it expands the population that can sue methadone programs. And um, it's, it's no longer just patients who are suing methadone programs. <coughs> and um, the, the real two big ones are automobile uh, um, accidents involving methadone patients, where um, either the family of the, whether they result in death, the family of the patient suing the clinic for allowing the patient to drive, or if other people come to the accident, then those, the family of those people. We're seeing a lot more of that, and that's a very big payout. And we're also seeing places that we never, haven't seen until, I haven't seen until the past five years or so, for wrongful diversion claims, where, um, again, take-homes are involved for that, um, um, where uh, somebody who's not a patient buys methadone, and, and it, usually, of course, you can't um, backtrack into who they bought it from, but, but when, they, when they can, the clinics can be held liable. Those can also be very large claims. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So um, the, um, there's some speculation that there's been a lot that claims are growing recently. I personally, I don't, I don't see a big jump in claims. You know, this, this, this concept of um, the negative publicity for methadone in the recent past has sort of created the, the in my opinion, possibility that claims could be canceled, but I personally don't see it. my book of business. And, um, uh, so I, I, just in terms of um, managing risk, I, I'd like to say, uh, you know, risk management is uh, sometimes can be a very complicated subject. I, uh, the American Society for Healthcare Risk Management, for example, which I belong to, for example, has uh, their risk management handbook, which is uh, 1,340 pages long. And, uh, um, with a lot of small print. But for me, risk management, it, and it's, basically, it has to do with identifying risk, which is what, that's why, uh, that's why I'm here to talk, talk about type of lawsuits of risk. Analyzing that risk and uh, that either uh, e uh, avoiding risk is, is the second uh, big issue in risk management, transferring risk and reducing risk. Uh, in my opinion, avoiding risk is uh, a little pro problematic with um, the healthcare field because uh, uh, there's always a chance of turning away your sickness. Of people who need treatment the most. And, uh, it's also limitations to risk transfer, which is you know, what, I, what I do. And the, the basic, the, 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 the main way to transfer risk, the most common way to transfer risk, is through insurance. But uh, I just think it, you know, especially uh, as someone who has processed these claims, who talks to uh, treatment providers who were reporting claims to me, I can tell you for you know for a fact that you really can't transfer the risk of injury or death to your patients. The only thing you can transfer is the, um, the financial consequences of the lawsuit. Uh, so the you know in, in my opinion, the, the real issue is risk reduction and primary needs of risk reduction is best practices. And um, I've, I've, I've had a few discussions with some people in the field, including Mark Perino, about you know, the difference between risk management and best practices. And, and you know, they both inform each other. Um, risk management uh, uh, is really meaningless without Incorporating best practices, um, and, and um, best practices takes into consideration this management. But I just, uh, I think it's, in my opinion, very important to realize that to, to have the, to have the concept that risk management should never trump best practices. That being said, I, I, um, I, I just like to say that it's really an honor to be here with this panel there. in terms of best practices there. We are, like Mike said, they're really tops in the field. I, I really think that you folks get congratulated for, for being here, and I, I, I'm quite sure you can get a lot out of these folks out this field. Good morning. I know back-to-back -back insurance guys, this is going to be rough. I'll try to make this quick. It's, it, it is still early. Um, let's see if I know how to move these slides. That's me. 
Okay, uh, my name is Rich Willits. Uh, as Mike said earlier, I'm the uh, director of a program that provides uh, insurance products and services for a broad range of behavioral health care facilities across the United States. Um, that includes, of course, uh, hundreds of OTP clinics. Uh, probably uh, we do business in 40-something states. Uh, I actually got involved in addiction treatment 10 years ago um, with the TCA, the Therapeutic Communities of America. I didn't know anything about uh, uh, methadone and OTPs until I met David Zerlip, and uh, he taught me a lot uh, about your industry and, and as it relates to insurance, and I certainly wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. Um, so I've been, been asked to talk to you guys a little bit this morning about the uh, subject, of course, of uh, adverse drug event liability and insurance claim trends in OTPs, kind of a what's going on out there from an insurance carrier's perspective. And I'm going to touch a little bit about uh, on some real basic points of uh, risk management as well. Um, so first, uh, a little bit about my background um, and, and why I'm up here. Um, I am not, uh, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a clinician, uh, I'm an insurance expert, uh, I also uh, have a risk management background, uh, 24 years in the insurance industry, commercial insurance, I do niche programs, and 10 years ago I got started in this niche of behavioral health, and, and we insure the whole spectrum of behavioral health care. Um, so there's other folks on the panel that are going to address the topic um, from uh, the, the more of the legal and clinical uh, standpoint. So my job is the uh, I'm actually directly responsible for underwriting um, claims and uh, risk management uh, in my program. So I uh, kind of have a unique perspective. I, I get to see, uh, I get to underwrite the, the clinic uh, when it comes to me on an application and, and look at the docs and everybody who works there and decide what premium you're going to pay. Um, look at your past loss experience and claim experience. Then, uh, then I sit and wait and hope that I don't find out that there's been an incident. Uh, but of course I do. Uh, we have over $20 million in premium we expect to pay out $10 million a year or, or more in uh, claims. Uh, so it kind of starts out as an incident. Uh, there's been a report of a, of a patient dying at a clinic. And then it may or may not elevate to the level of a claim, uh, which is basically a demand for money. Obviously, it's generally by the family uh, or spouse. Uh, and then uh, sometimes it elevates to the level of a lawsuit. Um, and so I get to watch as this, this process takes place and I get reports on uh, the overview of what happened, uh, what the allegations are uh, from the um, plaintiffs. So uh, anyways, so, so I get uh, the reports that come across my desk with all the depositions of, of the staff and, uh, you know, uh, witnesses. And then uh, you know get to uh, hear from the expert witnesses on both sides. So I'm kind of see a lot of your names as expert witnesses as well. Um, and uh, then the ultimate outcome: um, what are we going to do? And uh, quite honestly, in 10 years of doing this, I've never seen a methadone claim uh, make it to trial. We always settle these claims. Uh, they're very difficult to defend. Um, uh, as David Zerlip mentioned, um, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty when you get in front of a jury that neither side really wants to uh, face. There's a really limited track record in the U.S. of methadone uh, claims having gone to trial. So uh, we generally try to uh, settle them uh, as, as, as quickly and efficiently as we can. Um, so a little bit about uh, OTPs and the, the trends uh, that we're seeing, uh, kind of I'll give you just Without, I don't want to be too redundant to what David said. The big picture, I think everybody's aware that, uh, you know, the, you seem to not be able to pick up a paper without hearing something uh, uh, adverse, generally, about uh, methadone and drug poisoning and overdose. I get calls from uh, insurance company executives who, well, I know, like, this much about methadone treatment. They know this much. They read a, an article in Bloomberg that says, hey, there's this article that says heroin's better than methadone for treating addicts. 
what do you think of this? And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe they're giving this any credibility. But uh, in any event, I have to explain uh, a lot of times. And of course, I have to explain when I cut a check for $500,000 to, to uh, settle a claim. Uh, why are we insuring these guys? Um, and, and, and so uh, I think, um, you know, I, I'm deeply involved from that standpoint. It would be disingenuous for me to say I'm part of your industry. I'm not. Um, I look at it from a business perspective, quite frankly. Um, you know, like I said, uh, if I collect $20 million in premium, I, I would like to think that I'm not going to pay out $20 million in losses in a year. Um, that, that's basically the goal uh, that, that we have. So uh, you're part of that $20 million. And, and we'd like to keep you as part of that. Um, you know, we see a lot of positive things uh, about your industry. It's not all negative. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Um, I've visited many clinics. A lot of folks do really good work. And, and I agree with David, uh, and I believe that uh, methadone does save lives. Um, but you guys are under the microscope, okay? You're getting a lot of increased scrutiny because of, uh, obviously, uh, the, the fact that uh, there have been a great increase in the number of deaths. Uh, Specifically with relation to methadone, but but um, you know I, I read some things about drug uh, drug overdoses and drug poisoning overall in the U.S. Um, that kind of surprised me. Um, you know, a few years ago, I think uh, uh, 2005, um, drug overdose and drug poisoning, which includes methadone uh, uh, poisoning, if you will, um, became the number two uh, uh, cause of accidental death in the United States. It passed firearms. Um, and, and the number one cause of accidental death in the U.S., of course, is auto accidents. Um, but guess, guess what? Drug overdose is catching it and passing it. This will be the number one accidental death cause in the United States within the next few years. It already is in 16 states. So um, if I'm reading that and I'm seeing that, I can assure you that attorneys are also seeing that. And, um, you know, it, you, you think about you know the ambulance chasers and, and the accidents. Well, guess what? You know you put drug overdose, and they start thinking hmm, pharmaceutical companies, deep pockets, clinics with insurance. You know they didn't maybe they wouldn't have taken a methadone claim five, ten years ago. Uh, you know I don't know anything about that. I don't want to represent a drug addict or their family. But but now um, there's big money in it. Um, so 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 that's part of what we have to to watch out for. Um, so, uh, two trends that, 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 that we see from the insurance company side in, in, in methadone clinics specifically, um, and, and I can only speak for the past 10 years or so that I've been involved, but an increase in frequency, okay, uh, we're seeing more claims. Um, doing some rough extrapolation of the numbers, where maybe five, 10 years ago I saw mm, five wrongful deaths incident claims uh, out of 100 clinics. Now I'm seeing more like 10. Um, and, 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 and so it's kind of going the wrong way. Um, it may be that, it may not be that there are more people dying. It just may be that it's elevating onto the radar screen. Where maybe in the past it just, you know, it happened and the family thanked to the clinic for, for all the work they did. Now it's like they're calling an attorney. Um, so where things kind of maybe went away before, uh, they're not going away so much anymore. So I, I can't tell you that more people are dying in, in methadone clinics. That's not, not my point. More claims are surfacing uh, at the insurance company side. Uh, you know, so why do I think that's happening? What are some observations? Um, clearly, the reduction in stigma surrounding uh, uh, methadone. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's a good thing, and it also has a downside. Um, the greater availability of information on the internet. Um, it's, it's, you know, just Google methadone lawsuit and, and see what you get. Uh, you know, no shortage of 1-800 uh, attorney <laughs> numbers. Um, it, it's easy to get information about methadone and about uh, methadone-related death. Um, more attorney involvement. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, it, just looking at the demographics, in the U.S., uh, in 1970, there were 350,000 attorneys. Uh, in 1987, there were 700,000. And now in 2009, there's 1.2 million attorneys. We got 192 law schools cranking out 40,000 attorneys every year. <laughs> um, it's pretty simple math. These guys are hungry. 
You know, I'm from Philly, and it's a big legal uh, industry there. And this is the, the attorneys are in shock because for the first time they're having layoffs, and these guys have to feed their families and have to put, uh, you know, have to have to bring in money, and they're taking cases, and they're getting, and they're looking for new niches, if you will, uh, and, and, and I'm afraid they, they found you. Um, in the U.S., there's one attorney for every 200 adults, which is the highest ratio uh, on the planet. Uh, what else are we seeing that's causing an increase in frequency? Um, um, new causes of action, okay, uh, you know, uh, I think David touched on uh, impaired drivers. Um, uh, uh, cardiac issues seem to be popping up a lot when I look at, you know, the laundry list of allegations. Um, you know, number one is, uh, you know, you, you, you gave the, you ramped, dosed, uh, ramped them up on their dose too quick. Uh, or you, you, you missed the fact that they had a family history of heart disease, uh, you didn't do an EKG. Uh, I didn't see that, you know, 10 years ago as much or, 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 or at all. Uh, but it seems to be one of the top five allegations now, in, 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 whether it's, you know, hypertension or whatever that uh, you didn't pick up on. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to touch on uh, the, the documentation side of that uh, in, in a minute. Um, so those are some of the things that we see that are, are, are driving the, the increase in frequency. The other um, part, part B, o overriding trend that we're seeing from an insurance company standpoint is an increase in severity of the claims. So that's the uh, deadly combo, uh, increased frequency, increased severity. Um, insurance companies don't like that. Uh, think about like Florida in 04 and 05 in the summers when they kept having hurricane after hurricane and companies were freaking out uh, because there was an increase in severity. Um, we can't ensure that. Uh, we like things that are kind of fairly consistent and, and predictable, like life insurance. We can kind of take a group and know how many people are going to die and how much we're going to pay. Um, when you get an industry that has um, frequency of severity, you find yourself like at Lloyd's of London trying to get insurance because nobody can put a number to it. Um, you know, I insure clinics, and I'm and just going to throw some rough, rough numbers out, so if this doesn't match with yours, forgive me, but say you pay $10,000 a year for a clinic uh, for your liability and your property insurance and maybe a, a, a couple of nice cars in the parking lot. Um, um, you know, when I have to cut a check for four or $500,000, that ten grand does not seem like a lot of money. It's, it's not good math. It's not good business. Um, obviously, we try to pool hundreds and hundreds of clinics and thousands of facilities so that when somebody does have that unfortunate uh, four or five hundred thousand dollar claim, you know, everybody kicks in to support that. So I probably, uh, you know, uh, insure five million dollars worth of, uh, of methadone clinics. So, you know, I can handle a couple million in claims. I can't handle five or ten million in claims. So um, uh, we're not, we're, we're, I'm not saying we're there yet. I, I don't want to see it get there. So why are things, uh, why are these claims getting bigger? You know, five, ten years ago, maybe I settled a claim for 150,000. Um, nowadays, 250,000 is much more likely. Um, uh, just in, in a general reference, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the test case that, that we're looking at today, you know, is, is grossly distorted from, uh, from an actual claim that, that occurred in my program. Um, it's, it's been changed nine ways to Sunday, so it's not, not at all the same thing. But the fact is, it was a real event, and I just settled it after you know, several years for $350,000. So it, it, this, this stuff is real, and, and money does get paid, and uh, it will impact you. There's no question it will come back around. And if you can't get insurance, it's going to be very hard to keep your doors open and, and accomplish your mission. Um, the other things that, uh, that observations about the increase in severity that we see besides uh, you know, attorneys getting involved, which always drives up the costs, uh, uh, you, the ability to get information, again, uh, on the Internet. The attorneys are really getting better at suing you uh, from what we see. Um, patient demographic shifts. Um, you know, I, I think everybody uh, has probably seen this. Um, we're seeing uh, younger people. I just had a, a wrongful death case uh, uh, in a methadone clinic on a 20-year-old, which I thought was pretty young um, to be in a methadone program um, compared to what I had previously seen. I mean, we, we track all this data, the age, uh, 
the race, everything, you know, the socioeconomic status, um, to try to look for trends, uh, you know. Uh, but, you know, this is one trend I'm seeing is we got younger people uh, who um, quite honestly have, when we look at settling a claim, where do we come up with that $350,000? Well, it's about the value of their life. Uh, this person had a job, um, had young kids, um, you know, and a spouse, uh, you know, they've got significant economic value that we have to recognize. Um, so it's not just what, what would they have made for the rest of their life. Who's going to support these kids for the rest of their lives? This is not your 59-year-old homeless guy um, who basically we just pay the funeral expenses. Um, so that is driving the increase in severity as well. Uh, I think I saw some numbers that where it used to be maybe 5% of the, the, the patients uh, were addicted to um, prescription opioids. Now it's more like 30%. Um, and, and, and those numbers, I'm sure, vary uh, by, by, by region. Um, but that, again, is increasing the, the amount of these settlements. Um, so you, you're probably saying, okay, these, these terrible things you're talking about, increased frequency of claims and, and, and increased severity, but, but my rates are down. You know, my premiums are lower. I can get insurance falling out of bed. Um, uh, you know, I got agents calling me every day uh, wanting to quote my insurance. There's, I, there's these new companies I've never heard of that want to insure me. Um, and, and, and that's where I have to give you like this little brief, and I'll, I'll try to keep this brief, insurance primer about um, the insurance market and the industry and how it kind of works. Because there's this aspect that affects you more than anything you can do, um, but you can't affect it. And that is, I compare it to the credit market. You know, like a few years ago, everybody could get a loan. It was really easy. <laughs> you didn't even have to have a job. No income verification. You know, easy money. Um, well, guess what? We're in that cycle in the insurance industry right now. It is easy to get insurance. Easy. Um, and it's easy to save money. If you haven't saved 20, 30, 40 percent over the past few years, you haven't shopped your insurance. So it's not because you did something better or that you got this great new risk management program. It, you're just part of the cycle uh, of the insurance cycle, which kind of goes up and down like this. Hard to get insurance, easy to get insurance. Um, you know, but we're in a what we call a soft market cycle where insurance very competitive, companies stealing customers from each other. So you can be lulled into this real false sense of security. Like, Man, we are good. Look, our insurance premiums are way down. We must be really doing good stuff. Um, uh, don't buy it uh, because it will shift. Uh, just like the credit market, it, it, our market runs in cycles. I'll uh, show you real quick because I kind of forgot to flip my charts. That, that's just a, a, a graph of the, um, uh, of the insurance market cycle. So in, 2000, uh, in 2003 was the last hard market where it was kind of hard to get insurance. Uh, you were getting deductibles and premiums are going up. Um, you know, part of that uh, was driven by the uh, World Trade Center uh, event in 2001. There's two ways to make a hard market. Um, you know, insurance, there's this big pool of money, about $450 billion right now that pays insurance claims for everybody in the U.S. That pool gets depleted. They have to replenish it. So there's two ways to deplete it, like a slow bleed of lots of claims or catastrophes. Um, and, and a lot of these um, spikes uh, relate to catastrophes. That little blip in 92 was like Hurricane Andrew in Florida. Um, so right now you can see companies um, are in the tank as far as uh, premiums. They're, they're way down. Com and insurance companies, uh, quite honestly, in 08 and 09 are losing a ton of money. Um, so. The sense is that, that, that we may be seeing one of those spikes again pretty soon. And the reason I bring this up and give that little insurance primer is that uh, what do we think of OTPs? Um, and, and, and you guys really, I mean, quite frankly, are like subprime risks in credit. Um, not because you're bad people, but because you have that frequency of severity thing, <laughs> okay? So guess what happens when the market cycle shifts? You're the first ones who are going to feel it. You're the absolute first ones. Um, when, when, when you suddenly wake up and you didn't do anything different, you, in fact, maybe you implemented a really snazzy uh, risk management program, but your premiums just doubled. In fact, and then the next year they tripled. And uh, you're like, wow, uh, because of this cycle. It's not because of, of, of what you've done. So you're, you're, you're sort of part of that. That impacts you. I don't want people to think it's uh, just, uh, 
you know, of course your, your claims experience and, and whether you have a risk management program matters a lot. Uh, because people say, well, okay, uh, what's an OTP to do? We're part of this big cycle, you know, and we can't control it. Uh, what can we do? Um, well, everybody can, uh, you know, when the credit market shifted, what people did was take care of your own credit report, you know, um, uh, pay off your debts, uh, uh, clean up your own credit score. That's, that's the only thing you can do uh, with respect to the credit cycle. It's the same thing with insurance. The only thing that's in your control is, you know, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to make yourself as attractive as possible to insurance companies, um, uh, to accrediting agencies, uh, and, and really to the general public. Um, you know, your goal is to affect what you can affect every day, your cost of risk, uh, which is, of course, your insurance premium. Um, it, it, we do look at uh, whether you do have risk management practices and programs in place. Uh, and we do, of course, look at your loss experience. So um, you, you do have some control. You can be the best you can be. Um, so when the market cycle and insurance does shift, you'll be in good shape uh, uh, compared to others. Um, so real quickly, I'm going to uh, touch on a couple of uh, uh, risk management concepts because um, I do have a background in that, and uh, I do see things when I see claims that I think, oh, man, they had just... They had just done this. Um, you know, risk management, uh, I think David hit it on the head. It, it sounds like this weird, scary topic, nebulous. It's really pretty basic common sense. But we all practice risk management every day. You know, when we look both ways before we cross the street, that's risk management. And it makes pretty good sense. You'll cut down on being hit. Um, put on your seatbelt in the car. You know, it reduces the severity of an auto accident claim. It's not rocket science. Um, in, in, in fact, in, in a methadone clinic or, or an OTP, um, you know, um, probably uh, you know, just best practices is, is, is one of the biggest risk management uh, programs you could have. You know, um, insurance claim experience um, you know, in healthcare just says, uh, points out glaringly that uh, you know, just providing quality, quality clinical care is really the most effective way to manage your uh, liability exposure. I mean, every day when you open your door, you're exposed to risk. You can be sued. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, what can you do? You can provide the best possible care. Um, and that really does uh, have a big impact on whether you have a claim at all and whether that claim is $10,000 or $500,000. So uh, real quickly, a um, couple of basics on uh, risk management. We call them the four C's. Uh, for healthcare, um, and, and uh, it, staying current, okay, with with your updated information about methadone and best practices uh, in OTPs, and I know uh, these folks here today are going to talk a lot about uh, some of the current um, uh, trends and, and and things you can do with respect to to best practices. But it's amazing to me um, when I find it. Uh, there are people in your field who, after a claim, I find out they didn't really know about this various thing, uh, whatever, torsades or something like that. And I'm thinking, how can you work in this industry and not know about this? Do you? I read all this stuff. I, it comes across my desk, don't they? Um, so, so stay current. Um, uh, obvious, this, this stuff is really obvious, like I said. Thoroughly collect patient info before and during treatment. Again, um, I get to be Monday morning quarterback, and it is shocking when I look at people who um, either, oh, they forgot to fill out, fill out page three of the biopsychosocial evaluation, therefore we have no case, therefore how much do you want? I mean, something as simple as not completing a form can, can cost you dearly. Um, communication with patients, um, uh, family members and other health care providers, I, I think that's um, Pretty darn critical, uh, from what I see. Um, you know, you get you don't get sued by the patients; you get sued by the family. It's a little shocking to me. I think about uh, I see these things where uh, hey, we finally got Junior after 10 years or 20 years uh, with their addiction into treatment, and guess what? They're in for two weeks and now they're dead. It's like shocking to these poor families. Um, uh, I'm sure that wasn't the outcome they expected. They were excited and happy that that their loved one was finally getting treatment. And then they call the clinic, and the clinic says, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you about that. 
click. Um, you know, where do you think their next call is going to be? Um, they want some answers. Um, they just sometimes just want to know what happened. Um, and, I, and I think healthcare in general is moving into this arena. Um, there, there are apology laws coming up in a lot of states, and I, I think we're going to touch on that a little bit. Um, that maybe you might want to just. Um, it depends on the state and the jurisdiction, so I can't advise on this, but you know, you have to think about putting yourself in these people's shoes and, and how maybe we can deal with them differently to mitigate loss and, 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 and mitigate the, the number of lawsuits. I, I, I believe in our interviews with claimants that if they had just gotten a simple explanation, they probably wouldn't have called an attorney and sued. Um, they only did that because they couldn't get anybody to talk to them. Um, so, um, uh, number four C would be carefully documenting patients' records. Um, um, a lot of times we see claims that come in and uh, something changes. You know, you do a good job of documenting on the, the initial intake, but something changes, a new d d development, new information comes up and it doesn't get documented. Um, oh, they went on a new different prescription uh, that we found out about after they've been in treatment for a while. Um, but, we, but we really didn't document that. Um, that's that's just a killer uh, when it comes to um, you know Monday morning and, and the attorneys lining up and saying oh we got them now um, documentation will 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 will, will save your bacon um, it will um, it, that's the first thing that everybody looks at when there's been when there's been a claim or a lawsuit is is the documentation um, so all right good good risk management uh, is all about a risk management culture it's a top to bottom thing a lot of we, we insure a lot of big, huge companies, too, and they all have in-house risk managers. They have actually people who do this for a living at their companies. We don't expect you to do that. You can work with your insurance agents and your insurance brokers. They'll support you in putting together a risk management program. I know uh, CARF, JACO, they're, they're very supportive in this area, kind of um, is what they do as well. Um, you might consider putting an employee in your clinic. Uh, to kind of lead the charge, to, to put this together. It's always helpful when somebody has accountability uh, to get things done. And again, it has to be the top people have to buy in, and, and, and it has to be done, and, and the training has to go all the way through down to, to the lowest clinical levels. Um, you know, the people who, who are standing outside the door have to understand that what kind of culture your, your clinic has and, and what kind of place you're running. Um, so, uh, you know, if you just, uh, my final point is striving to provide top quality clinical care, um, paying close attention to these risk management basics, um, you know, make this a source of pride in your organization, and it will serve you well. Um, you really uh, can't avoid risk completely, but you really can manage it. So we're hopeful that, uh, you know, this little bit of insight helps, and, and what we're doing today with this, this panel uh, helps everybody to come away with a good feeling about risk management and feeling that there are things they can do to, uh, to improve uh, their facility because we can all always get better. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I know you're getting restless, but we would like you to stay with us for Oh, about another 50 minutes or so, but you can see the expertise that we brought just with David and Rich. And uh, one point they impressed upon me in discussions and preparation for today was that do not think that a, an agency getting sued is an indication that it's a poor agency, that the, the actions that they're seeing are often brought forward by some of the best top-notch treatment centers, uh, just that it happens to be something that slips along the side. So um, uh, thank you both for that great presentation of what's going on out there.